Hey, Dan O'Day here with my special guest, John Landecker. How are you doing, John? I'm fine, Dan. And you? About average. About um, average. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Jack. That's right. About average. And for those, for for people, most almost everyone knows who you are. But for someone who doesn't know no. who, who you are, uh, John, of course, is the father of Amy Landecker, right. whom that's... you know from Mad Men, Law and Order, oh, Law and Order Special Victims Unit, yeah, France, uh, right? Uh, also, transparent, uh, transparent, yes. Law and uh, Order Criminal uh, Criminal yes, Intent, ser a, a serious man. Uh, yeah, L.A. That... Vegas. Now, a serious it... man was was the Coen Brothers movie that was not Fargo. That is correct. Uh, and she also was on uh, a Law and Order Criminal Intent, Law and Order mm -hmm. Canine oh, Vision. I don't know. Did law I... and Order Under New Jersey. Um, yeah, you know. I understand they're going to cross-pollinate. They're going to combine it. Uh, and it'll be Law and Order Housewives of New York, <laughs> which yeah, actually, I'd like to see some of them locked up, but you've already gotten us off I, topic. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> no, I, yeah. Someone told me that you used to be in radio. Uh-huh. Still am, as far as I'm concerned. So you used to be in radio. Yeah, I oh. was. Uh, you want to know the whole radio story? No. Okay. I mean, we just had John because you're Amy's father. And oh, yeah. go ahead, you know, tell us about your radio career. I had heard the name, but it was Amy that I had heard. So I. Right, of course. You know, uh, but then I somebody said you used to be in radio. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess most of your career was in the Midwest, but. Uh, you grew up. Yeah. You grew up in Wyoming, where your first no, radio. No, Dan. No, uh, John. John, I've got. Wait, wait, wait. John, uh, hold on. Wyoming. Here we Wyoming, go. Wyoming, right? It's uh, there. Is a town in Michigan. Wait a minute. There's a town in Michigan called Wyoming, and I worked at a radio right. station in Wyoming, Michigan. But I was not born there. Wait I a was, minute. Wait a minute. You're telling me there's a there's a town in Michigan named Wyoming. Yes, it's outside of Grand Rapids. It's a very small community. Doesn't that cause lots of confusion? Yeah, because, you know, whenever I say that to everybody, they, they assume that I know how to, you know, uh, brand a cow. Yeah. Or, they, they, uh, they hand you a lariat. Jump, jump through a lariat, do, do rope tricks, uh, and, build a campfire. Can you do any of the chuck wagon, you know, all that stuff. And I can't because it's not, it's Wyoming, Michigan. Just, just, just a second here, I... Going to make some notes? No, I'm crossing out a bunch of questions. <laughs> I, I was had. born. That's too bad. I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. What was your first radio station, the first station uh, that you worked at? My first radio station was uh, WOIA FM Ann Arbor, WOIB AM Saline, your American family stations serving southern Michigan and northern Ohio. So this is your first job, and uh, you were a teenager. I was in high school, and um, I was in high school at University of Michigan High School, okay? Uh, run by the oh, University so. School of it. Okay, yes? wait, wait, wait. No, yeah, I know. Okay, first, yeah. first yeah. you're confusing us by talking about right. Wyoming, Wyoming as a city. Right. right. And now you're talking about University of Michigan being a high school. So no, no, they had a high school. Yeah, the but University their name was on it, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was... Uh, run by their uh, school of education, and they did experiments on students. That now, not, explains uh, a lot. By coincidence, University of Michigan was supposed to be my safe school. Oh, uh, boy, you're in trouble. <laughs> well, no, it's a really, really good college, right? Yeah. And so when I was in high school uh, applying to colleges, you know, DeVry, uh, places like that, um, I was, I was kind of top level, and I asked my sister, Eleanor, she was calling me from Oberlin, where she, Oberlin, oh. Ohio, and because she went to Oberlin. And really? Why would I lie? Well, wow, that's a, quite a esoterically uh, aloof, uh, educational, at the forefront institution. Well, plus, it actually is in Ohio, so... That there, would be true. There's no uh, trickery there. And uh -huh. uh, I said... Um, Eleanor, I'm up, I'm applying to colleges. What's a good safe school, <laughs> so that if all the top ones reject me, mm -hmm. what's a good school that I also can apply to, as a safe school? And she said, University of Michigan. There you go. The next day, a friend of mine picks me up to go to 
high school, which was on a high school campus, not on a university campus. Mm-hmm. We were just regular folks, plain folks, where, right. where I was raised. Yeah. And uh, John, who, who uh, gave me a ride in his vehicle, handed me a school catalog and said, hey, Dan, here's a catalog from Michigan State. You interested? And I, said, and I said, oh, yeah, my, my sister just said that I should apply there as a safe school. And I ended up going to Michigan State by accident. I ended up at Michigan State too, coincidentally. No, wait, you, but, you were you were at MSU. Yeah. Are you a Spartan? No, I, I have a I no. But now that you've gone to college education, I'm going to launch into this part of the story. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I was okay. I went from W O I A in Ann Arbor to W T R X in Flint, Michigan. Mm-hmm. To WERX in uh, Wyoming, Michigan, to WI, WMSN, the student station at Michigan State University, WILS, Lansing, Michigan. Then I went to WIBG in Philadelphia. I dropped out okay. of my senior year to do that. I was a communication arts major. I got this job offer from market number four, or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. I dropped out. My dad was a college professor. He was a PhD in sociology. My mom was a college graduate. My entire family was a college graduate. My kids are college graduates. I never graduated from college. I dropped out of my senior year. So uh, let's go back to the 90s. I'm doing mornings at WJMK. This would would be the the 1990s? Yeah. Uh, No, it would be the 1990s. I'm talking way down the road. Uh, Um. WJMK doing mornings and uh, for 10 years there. And the music director was a guy named Len O'Kelly. So mm-hmm. time marches on. Len O'Kelly ends up being a professor of communications at Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan. Now, I forgot to tell you one thing. The first college I ever went to right out of high school was Grand Valley State College. I was there for about a year and a half. And then I went to Michigan State. So Grand Valley State College, now Grand Valley State University, uh, was the first college I attended. So Leno Kelly ends up as an instructor at what is now Grand Valley State University. And he says, you know, you said you, uh, you know, dropped out your senior year and, uh, you know, always regretted it and don't have a diploma. Uh, How many credits short were you? And I said, well, I don't know. He says, well, why don't you send me the transcripts? So I got some transcripts from Michigan State and I also got transcripts from Columbia College in Chicago that I went to for some film school stuff uh, in the middle of the 70s. I sent them on to Len, and uh, they got there. So uh, I wrote a book, and uh, the current edition of the book is called Records Truly Is My Middle Name. The book goes to Grand Valley, and Len asked me to come up and talk to the students about it. Okay, I go there. It's a pretty big room, and I'm going, my, there's a lot of people got what, what's up with this? And there was a, a projection screen that said, Grand Valley State University welcomes John Records Landecker. And I'm like, wow. So Len and everybody come in, and I go up to Len uh, before this thing starts, and I say, hey, what happened to those uh, transcripts? He goes, well, this is a college. Everything takes a long time. We'll let you know. Okay. So it's a question and answer thing, you know, like you do. And then 50 minutes into this, my transcripts from Grand Valley State College appear on the screen. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and then launches into the story that I'm telling you, mm-hmm. and then introduces the dean of the college <laughs> who walks over to me and presents me with a Bachelor of Science diploma from Grand Valley State University, and January 29th, I'm going to be in the commencement. Wow, that's very cool. So now... uh, I think that is extremely cool. So at Grand Valley, uh, they're not Spartans. What are you? Uh, What's their mascot? Lakers. Lakers. You know, a funny story. I I was supposed to apply to that as a safety school, and I I just got all all confused. So, okay, you you got into radio w o i yeah 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 you were in high school how did that happen 
Uh, my well, I was always I've always been interested in radio. I don't remember a time in my entire life when I wasn't. I suggested to a political science instructor that instead of writing a term a, a paper, I would record a sort of a, a term tape, if you will, as opposed to writing one. And he said, okay, and I did. My girlfriend at the time, her aunt was the let's see, woman's director of WOIA, and uh, arranged for me to go one afternoon to the radio station to meet the program director, who was also the afternoon man, Ted Heisel. So I walked into the station with my tape that I had played, made for school, and introduced myself to Ted. And we had a little discussion. And then Ted said, uh, take this stuff, and he handed me some paper, and said, go in that room, and when that light comes on, read it. So I went in the other room, and the light was an on-air light, and Ted then launched into this uh, heartwarming tale of a local kid coming out to the, uh, you know, from high school, wants to be in radio, blah, 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 blah. Why, it's John Landecker, what? Come on, let, let's turn the thing on and see what he does sounds like. So the light comes on, and I start uh, reading wire copy. Did you have yeah. time to be, to get nervous before you went oh, yeah. live? Oh, yeah. So how are you? So before he, before while, while he's saying he's going to put you on the air, how are you feeling, and how how long did it take? Did, did you feel that way throughout your newscast, or did once uh, once you were talking, did everything else fade away? You know that's a really good question, which is surprising coming from you. But anyway, like, um, it was well worded too. I thought. <laughs> I thought, yeah. Um, I think inwardly, I was so convinced that I wanted to be on the radio. I mean, focused, absolutely sure, no question about it, that I was going to go through anything. My delivery was rather, it was okay for a first timer, somebody had never been on. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going out to this radio station after school and eventually got a job there uh, at a, as a janitor for $1.15 an hour. And then uh, Tom O'Brien, who's a, an attorney, now a judge in Michigan, had a show on Saturday mornings from 9 until noon. It was the only, quote unquote, rock show on your American Family stations. And it got its music from Discount Records uh, at State and Liberty in downtown Ann Arbor. You go down there, you get the 45s, you bring them back. You play them, you bring them back. Tell them where they're from, you give them a plug. So I was his newsman, and that turned out to be some of the best times I've ever, ever had in radio. So you're, you're doing news, yeah. and how, well, first you became janitor, and then, yep. I guess, uh, news, yep. and somehow you became a disc jockey, which I want to go then, on, I want to go on record as saying I believe yeah. that's a step up from janitor. I don't care what anybody I, says. I also did traffic. That is, and I'm not talking. I'm traffic. You know, logging commercials. Oh, okay. I, I um, hosted a classical music show, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, I went on remotes with Ted Heisel, uh, especially in the Ann Arbor Art Fair and Ann Arbor Bargain Days, uh, are a huge thing in the middle of July. And he'd take the radio station remote and he would start on Main Street and I'd be with him there. And then we'd, the midday we'd go to State Street and I'd be with him there. And then uh, later in the afternoon we'd be at South View. And he would leave and I would do a show from there uh, on, the, on the campus from this radio station. And I was able to look down at the corner at the Ann Arbor Bank revolving clock. And on one side it had the time. And on the other side, it had the temperature. Now, you know how important those two things are. They are vital to anybody being on the air. Yeah. Time, temperature. Uh, so so there would be, so you would look up at the sign and there, there would be a delay. You'd say, uh, John Landhecker, right now it's 312. Well, no, I mean, come on. And 17 degrees. No, I wasn't that uncoordinated. Oh, okay. No, I mean, I could see the clock moving. And so I appropriately spoke until uh, I could see what I wanted to say. When I, and it kept moving. It wasn't like if I missed it one time, it wasn't going to come back. Then Tom O'Brien got a job in Flint, and he left. And they gave me the 9 to noon slot on WOIA, which I called 
the midday ride. And I went to the record store. See, that, I, that, that's the Wyoming influence. Once again, the, you, you could see these influences. See, but I'm not there in Wyoming yet. Oh, okay. Well, go when ahead. I, I wrote, when I got to Wyoming, I was all, already a road and put up wet. Oh, okay. okay. Anyway. So uh, <laughs> Tom goes to uh, Flint and I do this show. And then Flint, WTRX, needs a uh, summer replacement guy. And Tom recommends me and sure enough wtrx home of the jones boys everybody's last name was jones except for people on the weekend and i did i think three or four shifts on the weekend and uh i wanted to be uh a jones boy so i called myself dow i'm not kidding so i was dow jones for one summer and doing the job uh, at in Ann Arbor, and then I... That's the worst, that's the worst air name I've ever heard. Not if everybody's, not if, not if uh, no. it's the home, the Jones boys, and everybody's last name is Jones. <sighs> okay. I mean, there was like Casey Jones and John Paul Jones. Okay, Casey Jones, I can, I can believe that. John Jones, I can believe. Yeah. Dow Jones, I think... Dow is, Jones. Is, right. I think it's a, a cool name. By the way, he's still in the news. I don't know. Yeah, if you yeah he's he's noticed. he's still hanging on there. Well, mm -hmm. on your on your first disc jockey show on W O A I oh, slash B, whatever W O I A. Yeah, I actually have a, a clip oh. of one of your first shows there. So I'm going to cue our engineer to All roll right. tape. <clears throat> roll tape. <laughs> All right, the live line is open. Hello. Hello. Hi, who's this calling? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, well, this is uh, this is good old Art Bolo calling in from Jackson. Yeah. Jackson. Yeah. But you're coming in like a local over here. Um, that's good to hear, Art. And where do you go to school? Pardon? School. Where do you go to school? School, school. not school. Where do you go to school? Uh, Greatest community college in Southern Michigan. Oh, well, okay. We, that'll be... Uh, my that That'll be $150 for 30 seconds. I do. I know. <laughs> well, listen, why don't you play a record for me? Oh, oh what song? For what? all my teachers yeah. who aren't giving me good marks like they should, Yeah. Uh, would you please play uh, Trey Martin's record, because I love it so much, oh. called The Work Song. Okay, we shall do that. Thank all right. You. Okay. Good. I pay long-distance calls. You pay my records. Okay. All right. Good enough. <laughs> Thanks for calling on the live line. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Right. Now. now, John, that's kind of, first of all, you were very good. Uh, but that's kind of an amazing coincidence. The caller, if I mm -hmm. heard right, was named Art Volo, and that's got to that be an, an unusual name. And there's an Art Volo who goes around yep. the world doing video. Yep. That they are one and the same. What? I've known Art. I have known Art Volo since high school. And by the way, didn't you just love how my voice was? That was what I called my puker era. <laughs> No, you know what I mean. It's like totally yeah. affected. But I think you also, I think, I think we also had in there the tone from in uh, our man Flint. Yep, so I go to the phone. So you were making that noise? That wasn't a, a recording. No, that was actually a recording, and I'm trying to remember how I got that. I did like the way you said school. <laughs> God. So bad. So bad. <laughs> no. It, yeah. It, John, it could have been worse. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. So uh, that was that was Art Volo. Already you mm -hmm. were conning your audience because you were tricking them into thinking you had a listener who was calling in and it really was a high school compadre. You know what? You're not far from the truth. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know exactly how many people listen to that station because they didn't take ratings of in Ann Arbor at the time. <laughs> so somehow you, and I know you, you there's a number of stations in between. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you were at Michigan State, Eight. were you on the student station at the same time you were working at WILS? No, I was on the student station first. And then after a while, I went out to WILS and met with the uh, operations manager, program director, air talent, uh, Eric for Seth and started playing religious tapes on Sunday morning. And then they gave me a few hours on Sunday. That didn't take long until they gave me a uh, regular shift at night. 
Uh, I also worked with another great guy named Craig Dudley. And there were two students who were not in radio, weren't on the radio, had nothing to do with radio except they were gigantic radio fans. And they contacted me. And I'd go over to their apartment after getting off the air at like one in the morning, uh, have a few beers, and they had... The now, were, were, they, were they sisters? Uh, no. Oh. Then um, these guys had... The oh, I'm numbers. sorry. I had the wrong picture. I'm sorry. These guys had the hotline numbers for the control rooms of Bill Drake-affiliated top 40 AM radio stations in the United States. KHJ, WRKO blah, 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 and they would call guys on the air while I'm there just to jerk their chain. So I don't know how they got those numbers. You know, you'd have to go in your research. I'm not going to try to explain who Bill Drake was if you don't know. Just look it up. Unbeknownst to me, they recorded one of my shows from WILS and gave it to a disc jockey at CKLW in Detroit mm -hmm. named Mike Rivers. Mike Rivers left CKLW and went to WIBG in Philadelphia. WIBG had an opening. Mike gave the program director, Paul, drew the tape. They called me. I flew in. I took the job. And they wanted to change my name. They didn't want to. They did. I went to, from being John Records Landecker to being Scott Walker. Wow. If and a could, really, really, really tight format. Let me just point out, at least they didn't ask you to be Dow Jones. That I think I might have rolled with better. So Scott uh, Walker, what, did, they, did you find out that they had changed your name only after you accepted the job? Or did yes. they? Oh, yeah. Great. So you show I, up thinking your job sure, is. Yeah. yeah. So that was disheartening. Uh, but fortunately for me, uh, Paul Drew did not fire me. And... Um, I started there doing uh, nine to midnight. Then I went midnight to six, six nights a week. Then eventually noon to three. And then the station was sold from store broadcasting to Buckley Broadcasting. So in comes Buckley and in comes Joey Reynolds. Rick Buckley asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, well, I want to go back to being John Records Landecker. And he goes, okay. So, so one afternoon, I'm Scott Walker. The next, day after, the next evening, following Joy Reynolds, I was John Records Landecker. And then things began to happen. Uh, now, I'm going to guess, because we haven't talked about this, but knowing how radio works, uh, one, one evening you were Scott Walker, the next you're John Landecker. I'll bet, mm -hmm. and nobody noticed. Oh, it was beyond that. Um, I went on the air as John Records Landecker and started criticizing Scott Walker. Oh, I like that. That's good. And got some calls, people standing up for Scott Walker. Didn't want me cutting them down. That's, I, never, I, I never said I was a, it was the same person. That's the most impressive thing I know about your career. <laughs> I, I, no, really. I really like that. Um, when, And I know this video is supposed to be about you, but I, I think it's safe to say that people want to hear me tell anecdotes about me. Um, sure. When I was in San Francisco... Uh, there's a Carpenters record, and the Carpenters, I don't know if you noticed, the Carpenters started out singing songs, and then when they started writing their own, they just made sounds, you know, ooh, ah, ooh, ooh ah. ah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so they released a record called, it opened cold, it was called Goodbye to Love. Okay. Oh, I know that song. Right. And uh, when I first got the record as a jock, I'm queuing it up. Yeah. And for people who don't know what that means, ask your, your grandparents. And when you... Uh, queue up a record it can be at any speed that your fingers moving so it was slowed down and i thought that sounds like the righteous brothers and so what i did i i as a 45 but i i dubbed a 33 to third version of it and then yeah. i had people call in and vote which which version they like better the carpenters righteous brothers or carpenters or the it was it was close um I, I, I you know what i don't remember who won i do remember the person who called in and said you know at first, I thought you were just playing the Carpenter song, Slow Down. But then when they got to the harmony, that, that I knew that was the Righteous Brothers. Seriously, I love the fact that you dissed Scott Walker. That was, that was great. Well, let me say, the uh, arrival of Joey Reynolds 
was a mammoth eye opener to me about how to be a personality on the radio. Jeff, for somebody I, for somebody younger than you, which is everybody every, watching, um, yeah, who is not familiar with Joey Reynolds. Well, they can look that up too. I don't have time to explain. Well, no, g- give a five second, five seven second description of his place in radio. A lot of people consider him to be, although he really wasn't shocking, uh, pre Stern, pre Doll, all that kind of stuff. Uh, theater of the mind, uh, word association, just generally unbelievable. Then he eventually left to go somewhere, and I took his shift, 6 to 10, at WIBG. And then WLS in Chicago called me. I get hired. I come in. They go, uh, we can't use the middle name. I go, what? By the way, God, I'm tired of saying this. It really is my middle name. It's not a nickname. It's not in quotes. My mother was Marjorie Victoria Records, and uh, that's a Dutch. Gr- that's Dutch, uh, isn't it? English, I believe. Oh, okay. Uh, or Scotch Irish, perhaps. I think also, okay. um, with with a little hint of Wyoming in there. Uh, yeah, just a, a sort of a smidgen. Uh, you know, like a woody aftertaste. I think is <laughs> really. Um, it's subtle, but yes. <laughs> yes, extremely. So uh, okay, so they didn't want. Did they say why they didn't? No, you know, did I not. think was they didn't believe it, or they didn't think anybody else would believe it. So but wait, but but somewhere in your career, you had a, a program director who thought they would believe Dow Jones. Well, then the program director left, and he had not only told me that I couldn't use my middle name, but. Uh, I mean, this guy gave me a huge break, okay? I mean, mm-hmm. he hired me at WLS. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And he was great to work for. Right. And, you know, it was the thing about the middle name, okay, I mean, I can live without it. PDs at that time, you know, sometimes can have uh, issues with certain record labels. His was with Warner Brothers. And we were not playing Schools Out by Alice Cooper or Layla by Derek and the Dominoes. But... We did break Donna Fargo's Happiest Girl in the USA because he heard it in a bar out in Arlington Heights. You can't, anyway. get, you can't get hipper than that. So I'm the 19 jock, and this is not doing me any favors. So he leaves. I go downstairs to our FM. I get schools out. I get Layla. I'm John Records Landecker. I play him on the air, and that's that. And I never stopped being John Records Landecker again. Oh, I was Johnny Peshtigo for a while. John, Johnny Peshtigal? Is it Peshtigal or Peshtigo? <laughs> Johnny Peshtigal. Okay. okay, so uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about either. Let's listen. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now. This was the end of the fir- This was the end of the music era at WLS. It was okay. literally uh, months from going all talk, and they were sprinkling the programming with. Sally Jesse Raphael had a talk show Mm -hmm. that came on after I was on on the air. And she was uh, always sweet and happy, and I couldn't stand it. And one day I was driving the streets of Chicago, and I came to a street called Peshtigo Court. And I went, Peshtigo? I was just clicked, Johnny Peshtigo. So my show stopped at uh, 6.30, and the Johnny Peshtigo show, Nicest Man in the Universe, started and was on for a half hour. Then, wait, there's more. What? It, it turns out there's a town in Wisconsin called Peshtigo, Wisconsin. And they had a huge, horrible fire there at the same time that Chicago had its horrible fire. That's right. So, the same day as the Chicago yes. fire, which was 1889 or something. Mm-hmm. Um which everyone, yeah, everyone has heard of. Right. Uh, the same day, there is a bigger, more devastating yes. fire. Absolutely, absolutely. In Peshtigo, and no, almost nope. nobody knows about it because I guess Chicago had a better publicity person. Yeah, and I had never even heard that there was a town named Peshtigo, let alone let alone that it had a huge fire. So can you can you uh, give us a little bit of the Johnny Peshtigo delivery? You said he was the Local. nicest guy in the universe. Hey, Dan. How are you? You're looking great. I'm feeling fine today. 
You know, the weather, it's That was me changing blustery. dials. You know, so. it, it's a little blustery, but... These days, you'd just that's go okay. like that, but I was changing like that. That, was, that's, that sounded... Uh, that sounded uh, nice. I don't know. That, it was a parody, meant to be a parody of Sally Jesse Raphael. So how, how old were you when you got the call to go to WLS? Uh, 24. And when you got the call, did you realize... WLS, or did you just... I knew WLS. Mm -hmm. uh, however, they were not my favorite Chicago radio station. When I was at Grand Valley State, I discovered WCFL, mm -hmm. and a spe specifically a jock named Ron Britton. Mm -hmm. And that became my go-to all-time favorite ever. So you were, you were disappointed when WLS called? Oh, no. No, 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 no. I knew WLS was a big deal. Uh, I just didn't listen to it. <laughs> so, as and a, I went to Chicago, and I went to work there, and I was, and it was fantastic. But so, as a job, first of all, did they call you at the station, like during your show, or? I think they did call me at the station, but I was in like the jockish lounge at the time. But yeah, they called me at the station. So when when you first got the call when you were at the station, mm -hmm. was it oh good that'll be a, a good move, bigger market, or was it holy crap? This is WLS, even though I like CFL better. This is a gigantic station, 37 well, wait states. A minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Philadelphia is not exactly chopped liver. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's market number what? Philadelphia is Dutch for chopped liver. Apparently, you didn't know <laughs> that. So. so, yeah. I mean, I've been in mar major market radio for three years already. Well, that's very, that's like, a very good point. Okay. It so. wasn't like, um, let me tell you, the difference between being at WILS in Lansing, Michigan, to going to WIBG in Philadelphia, that was right. scary. Going from WIBG in Philadelphia, where I was already John Records Landecker and was working my ass off and had the ratings were rising, bada, 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 bada. Uh, I was not intimidated by WLS. I was very happy to be there. W were all the other jocks older than you? Yeah. How did you interact? Eventually, the staff at WLS uh, was extremely let's just say tight with one another we were a click we weren't just an air staff we were a click okay we were a social movement we had uh code phrases we'd say to each other when we were on the air um we like would, like like good morning things like that yeah that's it um I, i'm still sworn by a non-disclosure i can tell you this our prime directive was that WLS was to be used as a tool for our amusement. Oh, I love that. That was it. We all went out to dinner uh, on the weekends. Uh, we're over to, we, most weekends, we'd be at somebody's house on the station staff. Um, it was fantastic. Now, that took a, maybe a year and a half to click like that. But when I got there, everybody was very, very friendly, although uh, I didn't know them at all. You know, I didn't know them from Adam. And um, and he didn't work there anymore either. So, <laughs> But Larry Lujak, in case you want to know who he is, look it up. Um, super jock. Larry was a huge Elvis fan, and I was saying, you know, um, I didn't think Elvis was that great. I thought the Beatles were much better. And there was a pause, and Larry said, only he can, and I don't know if I can do this justice. You don't know nothing about music, you Philadelphia f <laughs> and, uh, and that would have been a great air name, by the way. But I got to tell you, though, an incident happened uh, prior to me going on the air at WLS that sort of cemented the relationship I had with Larry, and it was a very good, I love the guy, mm -hmm. and we were great friends. Mike McCormick was the program director. And I hadn't gone on the air yet, but I was in town. And uh, he called me into the station and into his office. And as it turned out, I, John Landecker, never been on the air, uh, am walking into the middle of a Larry Lujak show critique, okay? Uh, which is where the program director takes a recording of uh, one of your programs, plays it to you while he's listening and criticizes it. Oh, okay? I, 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 wish, I wish I could have been there or I wish somebody made a recording of Larry Lujak getting critiqued uh, that's well, an air check I'll, session i only know what happened when i was there and so i sit down and mike mccormick goes uh hey i'm gonna play something for you tell me what you think of this 
So he plays a bit that Larry did. And uh, the WLS studios <clears throat> were on the fifth floor of the Stone Container Building in downtown Chicago at Michigan and Wacker. And the rear of the studio overlooked an alley. There was a, uh, a window filled with an air conditioner, a room air conditioner. And it didn't take much straining of the year to hear the uh, dump trucks, garbage trucks, that would come down that alley every single morning. One morning, Larry decided he would share that and took the microphone to the back of the studio and told everybody to listen. And sure enough, there were the garbage trucks larger than life. And so McCormick stops the tape. He goes, what do you think of that? I thought, I thought that was great. Well, apparently he didn't, because as we're walking out of the meeting, Larry says to me, thanks, kid. So that was that. Did you ever have run-ins with management at LS? Yes. Can you talk about any of them? I can talk about all of them. Um, just, uh, pick just the interesting ones. Okay, you can pick one of the wait, less wait interesting. I'm trying, there's so many. I did accuse the general manager once of treason because he gave a live concert with the group Chicago to WCFL. He passed on it. So I got lectured for that. Wait, why did I, he, why did the general, I don't, I, can I you don't explain know. that? I don't really know. No, I can't. I have absolutely no so idea. So you guys had the chance to be the station. We had it. Yeah. That. And I, don't, I don't know what the deal was. I, I guess the most classic one, if you want to call it that, um, concerns uh, You Light Up My Life by Debbie Boone, which is a huge hit. And I don't need to tell radio people that AM Top 40 stations in the 70s repeated the hits over and over and over again. So we were repeating Debbie Boone over and over again. And once again, I'm on at night, and I don't want any Donna Fargo. I want uh, Eric Clapton, and I want Alice Cooper. One night, the beginning of the show, I stop everything for an announcement. And I say on the air, all right, here's what we're going to do. I can't stand this Debbie Boone record. But I do know that many of you love it because it's being, it's selling and it's a hit. So here's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to play the first 15 seconds of You Light Up My Life. And then I'm going to stop the record. Then 30 minutes from now, I'm going to play the next 15 minutes of You Light Up My Life. And, then, and so on and so on and so on. And it will take a, the entire show to finish You Light Up My Life. So so this you, this was a tribute. This was a tribute to You Light Up My Life. It was highlighting it for, yeah, for the audience. Uh, so in the middle of this, live on the air, the program director, one of the best ever, by the way, named John Guerin, comes into the studio. And I convinced him on the air that at least the possibility existed that someone would keep listening for four hours just to see if that's what I would do. And John conceded that, yeah, I suppose it's possible, so do it. You can do it this one time. John uh, was the program director of a radio station that had Larry Lujak, Tommy Edwards, Fred Winston, J.J. Jeffrey, myself, Steve King, Yvonne Daniels, the list goes on and on. It takes a rare individual that's able to keep a group like that not in check. We weren't kept in check, but within the boundaries, let's just put it that way. Uh, because everybody had their own bit, if you will. Um, Larry uh, did the animal stories, which became a gigantic hit. Um, the Animal Stories news team, him and little Tommy, little Tommy Edwards. WLS um, used to be the home of uh, the barn dance. It was called the uh, Prairie Farmer. And left over from those days was a farm report that the jock had to do. So Larry's doing this farm report, and he didn't want it. Gee, I can't imagine why. And I guess somebody sent him a funny story about an animal. And he put that on the air, and one thing leads to another and another, and now it's the Animal Stories news team and Little Tommy, and they made albums, and it was just gigantic. Huge, huge bit. Very funny. Um, and then other people had 
other stuff that they did on the air. Um, okay, and, and you had something that, that yes, everyone who ever heard you there, uh, that, you know, I'll, I'll stop talking. What is it I'm about to mention? Boogie check. Okay, so let's start with where did that come from? Uh, one night, boogie check doesn't exist. The next sure. night it does. What, what, what happened? Uh, one night at six o'clock, boogie check doesn't exist and the show starts. But by the time the show is over at 10, boogie check exists. Um, Ed, could you could you give us a little more I'm, detail? Oh, well, <clears throat> as I had mentioned earlier, radio stations repeated the same songs over and over and over again. And that was happening. And I was bored, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Uh, WCFL was our big competitor. There was a jock on the air over there. I think it was Dr. Brock, I believe. And his signature was, let's boogie. And the term let's boogie was a prevalent slang term that was also on T-shirts, uh, whatever. As I had mentioned earlier also, there was a disc jockey named J.J. Jeffrey at WLS. He was single and he had a mustache. And before he would go out on a date, J.J. would conduct a 60-second booger check. So all of this collides in my brain one night. That's all. And um, I decide to, I don't know where the name came from, but I went on and called it Boogie Check. And what it was, was I would answer the phone's live on the air, uh, and check people's boogie. But needless to say, that particular concept was gone in about 10 seconds because WLS had no delay. And a kid said, F on the air. And, and, it, and this, this uh, was back when you weren't supposed to do that, right? Yeah. Not like now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, once the word got out to the Chicago teen community that people were saying F on WLS, uh, it didn't hurt. Let's just put it that way. Then another thing happened. Uh, as it turned out, I had a talent, if you will, for lack of a better term, when it came to spontaneously answering telephone calls from teenagers on AM radio. I was, I had never done it before. I didn't have any idea we were going to do it, but as it turned out, I was really good at it. And uh, I loved it because I didn't have to do any work, right? There was no preparation for Boogie Check or anything like that. I didn't have show prep, why we didn't say about it. I could be abrupt. I could be sort of mean. And nothing like this existed on the dial in America or anywhere else for that matter, as far as I know, anywhere. Radio stations like WLS, if somebody was on the air, they were either making a dedication or making a request. And those were usually recorded. There was nobody answering phones without a safety net on the air. Before me, I guess. And I didn't think twice about doing it. And it became huge. Huge. Whenever I would hear recordings of the boogie check, I got the feeling, and this is kind of a cliche, but I got the feeling that when you were doing the boogie check, you were kind of in the zone. That oh, definitely. almost like a bubble that you can... Yeah, but there was also an underlying uh, message to adults, which I've heard from some people that they got was, the way I was doing it was also in, intended to be sort of like a parody, if you will, um, that was meant for a non-teen person to be able to hopefully hear and get get it. Let's put that. They got it. The radio station cut a jingle, and uh, I was also visiting high schools for the WLS High School Team of the Week, and I always carried a tape recorder with me, and uh, I'll never forget it. I was at Addison Trail High School in Addison, Illinois, walking into a pep rally. The bleachers are full, but the basketball court is the only thing on it is a podium and to speak. I come walking in from one end and I got to walk down the court. And as I'm walking down, a spontaneous cheer erupts from the student body. And the cheer is, 
boogie check, boogie check, ooh, ah, boogie check, boogie check, ooh, ah, over and over and over again. I stopped everybody. I said, look, I got a tape recorder here. I got to get this. Started the tape. They recorded it again, and that became part of the intro. Why did you leave LS where you're having so much fun? And I mean, that's the bit, whenever I would, the air checks I heard of you, what I got yeah. was, and I, I guess some of the video things that, that our uh, good friend Art Volo, and mm -hmm. I don't know if we should say that, if, if I should say this publicly, because I know he's a very long and close friend of yours, our Art calls himself a radio's best friend. You did not invent that phrase. Who invented That's, that? Scott Shannon. You're kidding. Mm -mm. Well, I'm going to have to call up Scott because uh, Art's not going to watch this, so I don't have to worry. Really, <laughs> right. Art Volo is radio's brother-in-law. Okay. You know, it's sure. Like, yeah, Absolutely. He's, a, he's in the family. He sits at the table. Let's yeah. put it that way. I yeah. can picture uh, one of his little video clips of you in the studio, and you just look like you're having so much fun. Well, let's... This is not going to be a shock. <clears throat> As time went on at WLS, I discovered uh, cocaine and alcohol. Well, obviously, I'd known alcohol before, but not really cocaine. And when you do too much of anything, and specifically alcohol and cocaine, cocaine being illegal, it can change your mood. You can become an angry son of a bitch. And that's who I became. I was doing afternoons at this point, and WLS FM simulcast the morning show and at night, but they were going to have separate... Uh, afternoon shows. So I was on the AM and the station hired Steve Dahl to go on the FM. Steve Dahl was the hottest thing in radio at the time and deservedly so. When I went to those high schools, these kids also told me that disco sucks. They said so. And I recorded them saying disco sucks. And I would come in and play that tape over the intro of disco records like, you know, Donna Summer or whatever. So I got called into uh, Marty Greenberg's office, the general manager, great general manager, by the way. He says, uh, you can't say that on the air. I said, what do you mean I can't say it on the air? He says, parents are calling and complaining. I said, complaining about what? That you're saying suck on the air. I couldn't play it anymore. I couldn't say it. I couldn't play that clip. Not long after that, Steve Dahl did Disco Demolition at Comiskey Park, one of the best gigantic radio stunts ever. Front page of the newspaper. In my warped way of thinking, the fact that WLS, the same people who told me that I could not say suck, would hire the person who actually did, defined Disco Sucks in Chicago was, and put them on opposite me was like a knife in the back. Coincidentally, at that time, Bill Gable, who was the program director of CFTR in Toronto, contacted me about a morning show. And this move sealed it. That's it. I've got this offer. I'm going to Toronto. So I resigned and went to CFTR to do mornings. And it was like a year that you were there? Two. Two years. And... For some reason, you decided to come back. Chicago. Well, I had two daughters who still lived in Chicago. My oldest daughter had been on a school trip in Europe, and one of her classmates stepped off a sidewalk, was hit by a car, and got killed. And I didn't like being at arm's length. But then I got a job offer from The Loop. Um. That shirt has held up well over the years. Yeah, isn't it? You've already addressed, um, without my having asked the question, you've already given the answer to what question are you asked most over the years. Right. Which, what's What's the second most common question you get? By the way, for somebody who doesn't know what, what I'm referring to, when John said, John Records Landecker, you know, I assume the most common question is, is Records really your middle name? You have no idea. To this very, very day. Do they ever ask if John is really your first name? No. Huh. You know, people, you know, if I had a dollar for every time, I'm telling you, 
if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me if Rutgers was really my middle name, I don't know. I'd buy the White House. But if you hadn't said it on the air all those times, they wouldn't be asking. So, Well, of course, but I, I did it as a bit because uh, I was listening to WCFL, as I mentioned earlier, and they all had a – every guy on there had something going for him. Barney Pipp's People, Dick Williamson's World, the Stag line for Jim Stag. And I'm thinking to myself, what can I use? And I happened to notice – as it had been since the day of my birth, that records was my middle name. And my thought was, I would use this on the air, and people will go, no, that's not your name. And then they'll find out as it was, and they'll be amazed. And that'll be that. Well, we never got past the first part. <laughs> Did your mother at any time sue you for infringing yes. on her trademark name? Disown me. It's not. In fact, I had my mother on the air to prove that records truly was my middle name, and she explained on the air that, yes, indeed, it's true. And then we called my dad at home, the sociology professor, and he also reaffirmed it. I, I do want to point out that, that having your mom on the air and then your dad, that doesn't really prove that that's your middle name. I mean, that, <laughs> that doesn't... They could have been actors. Exactly. Well, I can get some actress to come in here and right. prove that I won the, no the Nobel Peace Prize twice. That's exactly yeah, right. I did, but let's get back to the substance abuse uh, years. How did, what, how did okay. you get out of it? One day, uh, I was working in Cleveland, and uh, I'd actually stopped using marijuana and cocaine. Marijuana was making me feel confused. And people were like John Belushi and some other people had died by doing something with cocaine and it cost a lot. So I'd already dropped those two, which means, of course, that the alcohol consumption went up. So I got a date and I got a little suite at a hotel in Cleveland. And uh, my girlfriend has to go to her parents' house out in the suburbs and then come back. When she comes back, she can't get in the room and she gets somebody to open it. And I'm passed out on the floor and the mini bar has been emptied into my mouth. Um, I don't have any recollection of this. What I do remember is waking up the next day, claiming I was the worst person on earth and she had to leave because this is horrible. And she took me to a therapist and the therapist said, do you think you're an alcoholic? And I went, hell yeah. <laughs> I was still sort of drunk. Let's just say that that was the beginning of the of something that's lasted now 27 years. So, John, uh, I know you got a lot of things to do, so I should be letting you go, but I have a, a few last... Whatever you want. ...questions. Sure. Okay, I've got things to do, okay? Right. Yeah. Let me just throw some important questions at you. Um, uh, what's your favorite, other than Earth, what's your favorite planet? My favorite planet? Uh, other than Earth. Well, other than Earth, I guess yeah. it would be the sun. Is the sun a planet? No. All right, then Pluto. And you mean the planet, not the dog? I do, because it has rings, doesn't it? Isn't that the one with rings? Uh, yeah, yes, John. Uh, Pluto yeah. does have rings. Well, I. what do you think? I go it, back and look at my does, astrology uh, homework? Your, All right, your, your Grandview College education really yeah. has paid off. Pluto. Yeah. When has I was rings. in Wyoming, you know, the skies are clear in Wyoming. You might not have one most embarrassing moment on the air, but is there oh, anything that, that occurs to you that, you, yeah. I mean, now it's funny, but you cringe a little bit when you. Well, now it's not that funny, and I still cringe. I, this was in that period of time when WLS was not that far from turning to talk. And I had been out on a bender you will, and came in to do afternoons and brought a fifth of uh, vodka into the studio with me. And uh, I'm going along, and Jeff Hendricks was doing the news, and I was talking with him, and I didn't plan on this, and all of a sudden I heard myself say, F and Jeff sort of, he was startled, and when the newscast ended, the general manager came into the studio, discovered the bottle, and then let me finish the shift. And after it was over, took me out to a bar. And you know what? As far as I know, 
Nobody complained because why? Nobody was listening. No, I, I do have to say, I thought you were going to say he let you finish the bottle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but in my second radio job, I, in addition to my disc jockey show, I had to babysit uh, the trading post. People call in to trade stuff. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've got a used lariat. And, yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. I'm doing the trading post. And not all of the callers are, are eloquent. And not all of them have planned in advance what they're going to say. And mm-hmm. so a caller was just rambling and rambling and She'd been talking like for a minute, and we we still didn't know what it was she had to buy or sell. And I say, <laughs> but it's oh wait, it's okay. <coughs> We're on a seven second delay. Right. I froze for seven seconds. Mm-hmm. Then I hit the I get pause it. button. So Absolutely. what people heard was me swearing, and then silence, which punctuated the swearing. <laughs> And, I, gotta I have to remember that next time. <laughs> yep. And that's when I learned one of my lessons of radio, which was has really nothing to do with whether or not you should swear near him. Actually, actually, it had two effects on me. Since that day, if I'm in a broadcast studio, I know never swear. Blah blah. I blah. mean, it, it, we could, the power could be out. It, you know, right. nothing. Right. But if there's a microphone, I'm not right. going to swear. Uh, I got him. Um, but the other thing that. is. Nobody complained. Nobody called at all. When the next jock showed up, he said, did, did you say <laughs> on the air? Uh, and that's it. And that's when I realized, okay, people aren't listening as closely as I am to to my show. But kids mm-hmm. don't swear on the radio. Am I right in assuming that for the early part of your career, you always were the youngest guy in the room? Yeah. Which... Makes you feel smart and special and talented and everything. You're at a different age, and I'm wondering how that feels. Not good. Uh, Because um, of how the society that we live in wants to take you at a certain age and put you somewhere. That's where you're supposed to be. And I, I'm not going there. I understand it. That doesn't mean that I have to walk around buying into it. I understand it, but I, but I don't buy it. Um, What what age are you inside, John? Oh, whoa. Uh, Maybe 27. That actually was the number I was going to guess. Seriously. Yeah. So uh, you're 27 and uh, uh, the paperwork says you're a lot older. It's possible that I should have introduced you this way. And instead, I will end the conversation this way. Uh, this gentleman is John Records Landecker. And I believe that in the 70s, you caused more people to become disc jockeys, to go into radio than anybody else in the world. That Thank you. when they heard you on LS, and those of you who don't happen to be from maybe maybe you're a different country or something, thirty-seven states I think the signal covered something like that. Yeah, yep. and I truly believe that more people became radio people because they heard you and and they heard how much fun you seem to be having. Well, thank you. I was definitely in the right place at the right time. Let's put it that way, and took advantage of it. And I was surrounded by people playing the same game. Right. And maybe just because you were younger than a lot of them, that sense of joy of, of uh, well, everybody in the radio. Now, wait a minute. I told you earlier the station was a tool for our amusement. That did, was, you know. Did you enjoy it? Oh, my God, yes. So was, so you're not arguing with me? No. Uh, I mean, it's like uh, every, almost everyone in radio, if they've been on the air, has said, I can't believe they're paying me to do this. And oh, I can believe <laughs> Wait a minute. I can believe they're paying me to do this, but I didn't get into radio to make money. Let's just put it that way. This is John Records Landecker, and I really do believe that he's the reason, the biggest reason people got into radio in the 1970s was uh, Mr. Landecker. And uh, final final question, is is Records really your middle name? (laughs) 
No, John, it's gr great to oh, talk to you. <laughs> good to talk to you, Dan. When you come out to L.A. to uh, <clears throat> take Hollywood by storm, uh, I'm kind of busy, but, you know, work, good luck. Work, have your people find me. Exactly. exactly. I'll be looking for you on the many Law & Order franchises. Law & Order, former disc jockeys, something like that. Yeah, so, yeah. John Records, Landecker. And, John, thanks for being here with me. My pleasure. Thanks, Dan.